the tale that I am about to tell you is a curious one. One that affected numerous people for over a decade during the end of Japan's Showa period, one that still brings fear to those who witnessed it, to the point that incidents involving this topic remain a taboo in certain circles. Allow me to introduce you to the Ikiningyo, otherwise known in English as the Living Doll. Its namesake is for good reason. This doll's story remains an infamy in Japan to this day, most notably for one of its television appearances in the late 1970s. A TV appearance that resulted in various mishaps that were witnessed live by thousands of viewers. Viewers who swear they witnessed this incident to this day. Though, before I get a little too ahead of myself, let's back up a little. To understand the namesake of the Ikiningyo, we must go back to the very beginning, that being 1976. Enter Junji Inagawa, a man known fairly well in Japan's television industry today particularly for his appearances on such shows as Takashi's Castle during the 1980s. During the 1970s, however, Inagawa was involved in two specific areas of the entertainment industry, those being radio and stage plays. The latter focusing particularly on bunaku plays, these productions showcase puppet-like dolls that resemble Japanese Hina or Ichimatsu dolls. Bunaku dolls are slightly larger and more articulated to accommodate fluid movements on stage. All was well in Inagawa's life and career, though it's when Inagawa was set to work on a folk music radio broadcast late one night that the first of many vexatious events occurred. It began with sudden, unanticipated crying. Crying that was hysterical and unable to be stopped. The crying came from one of the performers that were a guest on the show that evening. As Inagawa made his way to this performer, the station director was already trying to console him, to no avail. When this musician finally came to, he explained that he heard a woman's voice on the radio as one of his songs were being played. This voice belonged to a woman he knew, a woman who was now deceased. The intense feelings of sadness and longing for this woman overwhelmed the man and he was unable to shake these feelings despite his best efforts. The musician remained upset for the remainder of the broadcast. He was so distraught as it wrapped up that Inagawa ultimately escorted the man to his home after the broadcast had ended. Inagawa and the musician entered a taxi together, the stress of the night seemingly resolved and simmering down a bit. Only, this was solely the beginning. As Inagawa rode in this taxi, he started taking note of a little girl he witnessed outside the car window. A girl dressed in a red kimono. Such attire certainly stood out in the 1970s as this type of dress was phased out and rather old-fashioned by this point. Sure, an older woman in a kimono would not be too unusual a sight, but a little girl? The taxi continued onward, but he saw her again, and then again, respawning on every block despite not moving. The eeriest part of it all? This girl was making direct eye contact with Inagawa, and her expression. Inagawa described it as dark and filled with some kind of resentment and hatred. When the taxi came to a stop, Inagawa swears he bore witness to this girl levitating towards him, with that grim expression on her face becoming somehow more intense. And then, just like that, the girl was gone. Stunned beyond words, Inagawa looked around. Neither the musician nor the taxi driver were reacting in any way. They did not witness the same occurrences that Inagawa just had. They had not seen the little girl in the red kimono. Perhaps Inagawa was just tired, it had been a long day after all. As he finally returned home, he noticed his wife was already asleep. Inagawa decided to do the same. That very next morning, Inagawa's wife had swore she heard footsteps before she went to bed that evening. Despite this, nobody was home and Inagawa was busy working at the station at this time. Once again, Inagawa just shrugged it off. The incident at the radio station was long forgotten later that year when Inagawa received an offer to work as a scriptwriter on a developing bunraku play. 
Inagawa eagerly joined the production, appearing for his first day of the project filled with anticipation and excitement. But then, just like that, all of these emotions drained from his body, replaced by a heavy, sinking feeling in his stomach. All the heat from his body drained, he felt cold and unable to move. This was as he laid eyes on the doll planned to portray the production's main character. This was the doll of a young girl, a girl that strongly resembled the young girl he witnessed that night in the taxi, down to the red kimono and eerie expression. The resemblance was certainly uncanny, but surely this could be just an odd coincidence. Inagawa decided to once again conclude that it was simply that. With that, he cast his unsettling thoughts aside and committed to the project nonetheless. When Inagawa had first witnessed this doll, it had yet to be completed, the limbs had yet to be attached. The second encounter would involve a visit to the puppeteer's home who was cast to handle this lead doll. This person was referred to as Mayano-san. The doll was now completed, but there was a complication. For reasons unknown to Mayano, the doll had arrived with a broken arm and leg. Mayano swore that he had no clue how the doll ended up this way. When he returned the doll to the maker for repairs later on and even attempted to remedy the situation himself, the arm and leg ultimately became damaged again. The actual cause of damage was never witnessed by human eyes. The doll would just keep ending up like this. The crew attempted to seek out the doll maker one last time, hoping to figure out a way to prevent the doll from breaking yet again. With opening night of the play rapidly approaching, the situation had to be rectified soon. Though, when Maino Inagawa and the others accompanying them had arrived at the doll maker's shop, it was completely cleaned out and shut down. The doll maker had vanished, with no information given on where he left to. He had completely vanished without a single trace. People who created and repaired these types of elaborate dolls were far and few between by that time. Once again, even in late Showa Japan, such things were becoming scarce. The crew didn't have the time or funding to seek out another doll maker. The events that took place following this proved to be even more jarring. Shortly after the disappearance of the doll maker, the scriptwriter tasked with writing dialogue for the play shared some unsettling news. His house had completely burned down. He was able to escape, but the house itself was destroyed in its entirety. The portion of the script that he had been working on was also completely lost. Being long before the days of internet and digital preservation, they simply had to start from the beginning. It was shortly following the setback that tragedy struck yet again. Mayano, the lead puppeteer, shared news that his cousin had passed away suddenly. The official cause of death was unable to be determined at that point in time. His cousin was young and healthy, it was a shock to his entire family. Despite these horrible setbacks, a lot of progress had been made to complete this production. Beyond that, a great deal of time, energy, and of course, money had been invested in the completion and they had to make that money back. For the sake of those working on the project, especially those who needed that money in the wake of their recent tragedies. With that considered, the production team did their best to see the whole thing through, Inagawa doing so with a feeling of dread still recalling that little girl in the red kimono, an image in the back of his mind with each passing day. The road to opening night was filled with mishaps. While not as prominent as homes burning down and relative deaths, various accidents came about without any valid explanation in sight. First, lockers filled with costumes would become soaked with water. These lockers were not anywhere near any pipes or water source. Next, other props such as wigs would suddenly catch fire, sometimes while cast members were wearing them. These incidents eventually ended with various injuries to the team. As time went on, Inagawa eventually took note of a pattern in these injuries. Each and every one, without exception, was to a right hand or right knee. Inagawa then thought back to that doll, 
to the broken areas that just couldn't be completely fixed. Especially now that the doll maker was missing in action. The areas broken on the doll were also located on the right arm and right leg. Was this all, really, just a coincidence? At this point, Inaga refused to believe it as such. This was the final straw. He then tried to persuade the theater group to drop the project altogether. Proceeding could prove to be too dangerous. The others did not agree and did not believe him, feeling the ideas Inagawa presented were too outlandish and that the incidents were merely coincidental. The need to make a profit on this project and see the fruits of all the combined creative efforts were of a much higher priority. And Inagawa, while he didn't agree with these statements, decided to stay on the project as well. He was mainly worried for his co-workers and their safety. Inagawa ultimately decided to press on and see the project to its completion. This brings us to opening night at long last. The sets were prepared, the cast adequately prepared after countless rehearsals. The play was set to debut at noon, but shortly before, cast members began complaining that they lost sensation in their limbs. Some expressed an inability to speak. Despite their best efforts, the play could not premiere as planned and they had to reschedule to the next day. Inagawa decided that he should take independent actions to try and correct the situation, that being the spiritual situation with the doll. Not knowing what else he could possibly do, he visited local shrines in the area and purchased various charms and items that he felt may help. It seemed silly, but at this point, what else could he do? At this point, nothing was happening to Inagawa directly, and he was primarily worried that his fellow team members would get hurt, more than they already had been. This, much to Inagawa's relief, seemed to help. The play debuted without any issue, that is, until the final act. This involved a scene with the doll being placed in a coffin. When the doll was meant to move in the scene, emerging from the coffin, something happened. This was when the crew heard a loud thud, followed by another smaller one. Looking down, they realized all the limbs on the doll just fell off. In unison, without any warning, Inagawa also recalls the entire stage area becoming cold, almost frigid. Some who were present also recalled the stage appearing to have a fog over it. According to the cast members, this was not meant to be an effect. They were unclear as to where the fog came from. The play itself was well received, so much so that the producer and Maeno-san became enthusiastic about continuing, and continue they did. During the run of the play, Inagawa received word that his father had passed away. He, to this day, remains unsure if his father's death was actually related to the events experienced during the run of this play, however. And as a side note, Inagawa has been very discreet about the name of this production and where it took place and how long it took place. Photos do exist from behind the scenes, one with the doll Inagawa and Maeno. I can merely only assume that Inagawa is worried for those who seek out this supposedly cursed play. This is why he's so secretive about where the play actually took place and what it was actually called. And at long last, the play finally did conclude, and now came time to decide what should be done with the doll. To Inagawa's surprise, Mayano actually agreed to take it. Inagawa thought this to finally be the end of it all, that he could move on from all of this. But this is when the TV appearances came into play. Out of nowhere, Inagawa began to receive calls from television and radio programs. Being in the entertainment industry himself, he was fairly easy to reach. This was no surprise in itself. Somehow, people had caught wind of what happened with the doll during that recently finished stage production. They were fascinated by the incidents surrounding the doll and thought it would make for good TV. Inagawa, not having the doll in his possession, passed the message along to Mayano, who was willing to make appearances with this doll. So there were a couple attempts to film with Mayano and the doll, though at this point, none were deemed useful. 
These attempts included the earliest of incidents such as lights falling and equipment not working or turning on. The first attempt is said to have included Mayanol at some point mumbling words to the doll, as if he was having a conversation with her. Mayanol would later claim to have no recollection of doing this at all. According to Inagawa himself, a film reel of this failed TV broadcast attempt does exist within the studio's vault, which he left unnamed aside from the studio being Tokyo-based. The earliest successful public distribution of the story being told was in Young Lady magazine in 1978. The retelling in print made it easier to get the word out without any slip-ups. And word definitely got out. Following that TV incident with Maeno, Inagawa took the doll into his possession. He decided to go full force with purifying this doll spiritually and found a psychic in attempt of having this doll rectified or cleansed somehow. To Inagawa's bewilderment, the psychic refused to take the doll. She even refused to look at it, claiming it was too evil. Inagawa pressed the psychic to at least try and help with the doll, as it already affected so many people. The psychic then told Inagawa that the doll was definitely cursed. No surprise here. The psychic also shared a rather startling revelation, one received without the psychic knowing any prior info regarding the doll's background. You see, according to the psychic, the doll was possessed by multiple spirits, the most powerful of which being a little girl. According to the psychic, the fate of this little girl in her living life was an untimely death during an air raid during World War II. Her specific cause of death? Complications from losing both an arm and a leg. The psychic did not share anything further. Years later, Inagawa had heard that the psychic had passed away shortly following his meeting with her. Inagawa decided to continue attempting to tell the story to the masses. After all, the doll had still yet to harm him directly, and he felt it was a tale worth telling. The Ikiningyo's most infamous television appearance, one that made this doll well-known throughout the country of Japan, would take place in 1979 during a segment for a daytime variety show known as Plus Alpha. The incidents witnessed during this live broadcast are vividly recounted on sites like Nichan to this day. This incident itself, despite many vivid recollections, only aired one time It is now lost media. The 1979 incident on Plus Alpha is what truly brought to life the Ikiningyo legend that remains strong to this day as one of Japan's most renowned urban legends. There are people all over the Japanese internet who will defend their accounts of this incident 100%. These separate accounts are all very similar to each other. Found on Nichan, YouTube comments, and even Yahoo Japan Answers, they're all very similar in narrative. The broadcast incident remains lost to this day, though common details shared online are as follows. The Plus Alpha broadcast featured a group of people. This included Inagawa, Maeno, the Plus Alpha hosts, and one other special guest, a renowned psychic. The broadcast was held live, and viewers were encouraged to call in with any questions they had. And it was not long before a high volume of calls were received, all of them asking the same thing. That being who the child next to the doll was. But you see, there was no child. No child was present on the set. There are also accounts that claim the child appeared to be on Inagawa's shoulder rather than next to the doll who was on the other side of the room. Clearly, this question confused Inagawa, Mayano, and the hosts. Witnesses even recall that the hosts verbally repeated the question out loud on the broadcast and were visibly confused. As I said, there was no child next to the doll, it was sitting by itself. What most accounts claim to have seen was a young boy standing next to the Ikiningyo. It wasn't long after these questions and the confusion that followed that the studio lights began shaking, flickering, and ultimately falling down. According to some, metal poles fell as well, almost hitting the group being filmed. At this point, the show went off air for a bit, attempting to cut to commercials, but the station was having trouble doing so. Some recount an off-air signal being displayed before commercials ultimately appeared. 
First-hand accounts of those on set at the time claim both the audience and crew were terrified and trying to escape the studio for a short time, that the entire scene was chaos. Yet another claim is that the expression of the doll changed when the show resumed its broadcast. Those who saw it claim the doll appeared angry. It's really not confirmed, at least from what I've read, if the doll's expression change was before or after the cut to commercials. Following this incident, the episode had become somewhat of a taboo topic and never aired again. It's unknown if the film was destroyed, recorded over, or just left in an archive or warehouse to slowly rot away. The thing with film is it doesn't stay preserved forever, so if this film wasn't destroyed in some way already, it will be eventually. So, because this specific episode of Alpha Plus, a show that ran for 10 years between 1972 and 1982, only aired one single time, many simply doubted its existence, thinking it was nothing more than a myth. Though, regardless, and especially after the internet came into play and connected the masses, many swore they watched this segment on TV. And if you're assuming this whole story is a work of fiction with the whole spooky story vibe, well, guess what? Screenshots of the actual TV appearance did actually surface online. Yes, this incident really did happen, and it's well known to many people throughout Japan, even to this day, 44 years later. And these images have been passed around on image boards for quite some time now. There's also a later TV appearance with Inagawa and a replica of the Ikiningyo that did surface as well. Footage of this later appearance can be found on YouTube and Nico Nico. The full original broadcast of that first 1979 appearance has not been recovered aside from these images though. I've said this plenty of time in my lost media videos, but it's worth saying again here. VHS recording did exist in the late 1970s, though was not commonplace just yet. Later on, Betamax recording specifically caught on in Japan, however. This specific tape format does better in preserving media over the standard VHS tapes people were more acclimated to in the West. With that said, later doll appearances being documented are somewhat likely. The infamous one, however, possible but not likely, unfortunately. So, what about these later appearances, and what about the doll itself? What eventually happened to it? Well, as I said, Inagawa made appearances with this doll on a few more occasions following this. Despite the apparent dangers the presence of this doll entailed, TV stations ate the lore behind this doll up, and when it came down to it, the doll made for good TV. And good TV equaled positive ratings and high viewership. Many of these TV appearances can be found online. The way Inagawa discusses his time with the doll is rushed and almost panicked. The speed and cadence of his speech is not something I've personally witnessed with any other native Japanese speaker. <laughs> But let's get back on topic here. What became of the doll itself? Inagawa continued in his pursuit to seek out a way to somehow cleanse this doll of whatever evil spirits haunted it. A resolution came sooner than expected. The night after the occurrence at the studio, Inagawa and Mayano visited the home of a friend and colleague, a man by the name Taniguchi. His family ran an inn in Nishizu, a small seaside town in Shizuoka Prefecture. Inagawa and Mayano entered the inn with the doll, and Taniguchi's family, who was greeting them at the entrance, went silent. Upon looking at the doll, it was understood why. The eyes of the doll appeared bloated, the mouth was split apart on both sides, and some kind of sick grin. The hair of the doll had changed color and was standing up as if it was electrocuted. This doll now better resembled a Hanya or Kuchisake Ona, a woman prevalent in Japanese folklore. But rather than turning Inagawa and Mayano away, Taniguchi's wife made an unexpected offer. 
to take the doll to be enshrined as well as make her a fresh kimono as the current kimono was a little dirty. Inagawa agreed and the doll was left at the Nishizu Inn. Following leaving the doll in Nishizu, things were rather peaceful. Work continued as usual for Inagawa and Mayano even received an offer to perform in a production in Europe. Aside from retelling this tale, this ordeal seemed to be finally behind Inagawa and his peers. This was until news of a second house fire broke out. The victim this time was none other than Mayano himself. He was burned alive. What's odd is that shortly following the receival of this news, Inagawa had spoken to Mayano on the phone. Inagawa would later learn that Mayano was already confirmed dead before Inagawa had spoken to him on the phone. Inagawa believes to this day he was speaking to Mayano's ghost. Following this, Inagawa decided to not speak about the doll for quite some time, to completely shut down any discussion involving it. It was just too painful to revisit after Mayano's passing. This was until years later when Taniguchi arrived at Inagawa's home, insisting to speak with him about it. It took a little while, but Inagawa eventually conceded. This is when he learned that the doll continued to wreak havoc beyond what Inagawa had thought. Apparently, the doll had formed some kind of bond with the young daughter of Taniguchi. The girl began to stay up all night and claimed that the doll spoke to her. This young girl ultimately stated that the little girl haunting the doll wanted Mrs. Taniguchi to be her new mother. This understandably frightened Mrs. Taniguchi, and she expedited the process of enshrining the doll. And by expediting, she did not make the new kimono, she did no more than shove it into the hands of someone at a local shrine, and just wanted nothing more to do with it. Not long after this, a temple priest had contacted the Taniguchi family with the final outcome of this doll. At some point, the doll simply vanished from the shrine. Nobody within the shrine could explain how or why the doll vanished. They just woke up one morning and it was simply gone. Inagawa would tell this tale to countless audiences following this specific incident. He even claimed that the spirit visited his home one last time late at night. As initially, a dark shadow standing right outside his rice paper door. No one was in the house that night and that shadow was definitely not a simple human one. Inagawa tried to ignore it and just go back to sleep. That is, until the door began to slowly slide open. He could make out a face in the darkness, peeking at him from the cracked door. That's when he realized it. It was the doll, the doll was moving, and she had found him. Inagawa, amidst his panic, wondered if his late friend Mayano had seen this very sight before his house became engulfed in flames and he met his demise. But then, just like that, the doll became a shadow once again, and then the shadow disappeared. This would be the last time Inagawa saw the doll. This was over 35 years ago. It was in 1999, following another television appearance where he discussed the doll, that Inagawa met with Taniguchi's daughter once again. The daughter, now a grown woman, told Inagawa that she had maintained some kind of telepathic connection with the doll and knew where it was, roughly, at all times. She claimed that the doll seemed to be stored away in a warehouse in the mountain somewhere at that time, that time being 1999. The daughter left Inagawa with one final message that the doll told her that it would reunite with Inagawa again somewhere, someday. Inagawa asked her to elaborate and she said nothing. Instead, she drew a picture. It was of a stage complete with unique props and lighting. Inagawa recognized it immediately. It was the stage he performed on with Mayano all those years ago. Inagawa would also later discover the whereabouts of that doll maker that vanished all those years ago. He was apparently a monk now, living in solitude. The doll maker's decision to do so was not something any of his peers or loved ones were familiar with, he just simply did it without warning one day. As I said, Inagawa would continue to tell the tale of this doll and the havoc it wreaked on his and his loved ones' lives for many years. Though now he would do so with the replica doll as the current whereabouts of the actual doll were unknown. 
perhaps that's a good thing. See, this is why that mid to late 80s television appearance that surfaced online featured a replica doll and a photo of the original doll, because the true Ikiningyo's whereabouts are unknown. So, the elephant, or perhaps the child's ghost, in the room. There's a huge element of this story that I have refrained from discussing until now. I have already explained that Junji Inagawa is a famous television personality. Appearances on television and working with Japan's entertainment industry was very much commonplace to him. However... One detail I left out, one element of Junji Inagawa's career that he is very well known for, possibly best known for, is that he is a professional ghost storyteller. So famous, in fact, that there is a Japanese ghost storytelling competition named after him. It's called the Inagawa Grand Prix. And that way he talks fast, that kind of panicked way he tells a story that I mentioned previously, it's a storytelling technique that he's well known for. He sold everything from cassette tapes to PS1 games that explore his ghost stories. He even has a YouTube channel he uploads to today. Now, this revelation may deconstruct this whole story quite a bit. However, even Inagawa himself claims this specific ghost story has truth to it. That the horrors he faced fueled his drive to construct and distribute the tale in the first place. Inagawa even states that the tale is a rather difficult one for him to discuss today. And what of the people that supposedly passed on in the tale? Did they really die? That's something that I have personally been unable to confirm. What's also possible is that Inagawa constructed the story from scaled down real events. Perhaps the origin is real, perhaps he still saw that girl's ghost outside his car in the mid 70s. Perhaps all of it is real and Inagawa tells this tale to spread awareness. Perhaps it's not a tale for entertainment purposes, that it's a tale that's cautionary in nature. If this tale is genuine and based on true events, consider this a warning, because that means that the Ikiningyo is out there and nobody truly knows where she is today. Just know, if you ever find yourself in Japan and you come across a doll with this appearance, there is only one piece of advice I could give you. Run. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to give a shout out to all my beloved Patreons, my Stardust Crusaders, if you will. This includes... Airfire, Alan Achondo, Anna, Andrew LaPena, Andrew Valencia, Angel Pena, Aurora Phoenix, Beastmen Manor, Bishonen Knife, Brandon Tran, Christopher Valencia, Daniel Barrientos, Digital Dubs, Donut Brewit, Dude Bro, Eels, Enigdra J. Reese, Felix Gonzalez, Good with a Stain, Grand Tactician, Lilo, John Slisser Plays, Jordy Kirk, Judy 18, Kevin, Leon X8, Melatichi, I love Tamagotchi, Michiru Oji, Mike Master, Momo Buns, Morlane, Mr. Anderson, Nicholas Allen, Oddish Gloom, Pan Fried Life Jacket Awareness, Peachy Megs, PPASSCTAG again, I apologize. I love the possum image though. Quetzalcoatl, I believe, FC. Raz Cohen, C Chameleon, Shivam Vashi, Soko, Sophia Gilepsi, Upside Rounder, VHS Vich, Sutajio VGMU, Vani, Adrian Buttock, and Andre K. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you look forward to the future Patreon benefits. I do have extended cuts of my darker videos on there if you're interested. And I will also have, um, you know, early Patreon uploads, like, before I put them on YouTube on there as well for like other videos aside from the dark stuff. So if you are interested, then check that out. But yeah, see you guys in the next video. Bye.